So that's a vibrant market. And then the last graph on the lower right shows you the optical component transceiver and transponder market uh, for telecom, and it's shown you a huge growth for 100G, and it's, uh, it's going to be over a billion dollars in 2016. So what does this all say? The telecom market for a waveguide-based modulator is going to be a very strong market pull for optical components. So this is actually really exciting for us. And if you start looking at our actual waveguide polymer modulators, and you compare them with the incumbent in the marketplace, which is lithium nibate, and you look at some of the specifications, we have some great technical specifications we can achieve on the polymers. So we're in a really nice position where we can address these three big issues. Speed, we know we can go the performance and speed. And I'm showing here we can go up to terabit per second transceivers. So that's not 100G, that's 200G, that's 400G. So we can actually uh, achieve some of those metrics. We know we can scale in low cost. There's the next slide I'm going to show you about manufacturing cost by using the polymers, because um, we're using a spin-coated technology. And we know we can start integrating these onto a silicon platform, which is exactly what these big data center customers are looking for. So the key aspects are present in polymers today. And if you look at from a manufacturing standpoint, this is what's really exciting. You take lithium nibate, that's a crystal technology, it's a wafer technology. It's a, it's a very complicated manufacturing process. These things aren't cheap. This is what keeps the cost structure high. You take a polymer-based solution, in this case, uh, a waveguide modulator. Yes, we have larger wafers. We can do this at high-speed manufacturing. But in the end, it's much less expensive to manufacture because we spin coat on the polymers. And then from a manufacturing standpoint, that's really great. So the polymer-based devices, this is really a jump to low-cost manufacturing. This is really exciting. And so what do high-value telecom devices look like? Well, this slide is showing some um, typical uh, modulator devices. In this case, they're from Fujitsu, so they're not ours. It's just showing you what telecom modulators look like. And you can see there's a big, expensive gold package here. There's fibers going in and fibers going out. And you can see some optical connectors on either end of the fiber. Um, these are 100 gigabit per second high-speed telecom modulators. And so there's a potential to go much higher speed in operation. There are applications, you see them in telecommunications long haul trunk networks. You also see them in metro networks. But the metro networks are now asking for lower cost solutions. So while this is the incumbent today, we do know the modulator is a key component. And once we can figure out to bring down the cost structure, package these, these devices at lower cost, that will give us a great opportunity into the marketplace. So with that, let me talk about data center, because data center is a really exciting part of the program. Um, what's happening in this environment? I mean, everybody, when you look at what's going on out there, you're hearing about data centers. You're hearing about the cloud. Most of you may use Apple Cloud, and you send stuff up to the cloud. Well, where is it all going? It's actually going not actually in the sky. It's actually going to data centers. So what's this all about? Well, it's lots of bandwidth, because we're using lots of bandwidth in our computers. But it's a huge opportunity. You can see these metrics here. There's 44% growth in the content, which is the stuff that goes through the internet. The cloud traffic is growing at a really good clip. And so these metrics are looking really good. And this means that the companies that deal with all this data and traffic, I've got to figure out how to deal with it. They've got to put it into a place and switch the traffic. So when you go on the internet and you want to go to eBay or you want to go to Google, I mean, you're going to have to actually send the traffic, and somebody's going to have to switch it to one direction or another so that you can go to your websites. So if you start thinking about this for a second, what is a data center? Now, some of you may have seen these figures before, but these are photographs that Google shows inside their data centers. And you can see they're bigger than IKEA. I mean, these guys have motorized scooters to go up and down these places. And see how See how big they are? I mean, that's, that's like two, 300 meters long. And, and these are three different data centers. Now you're seeing these racks. See these racks? These are racks of equipment, electronic and photonic equipment. You'll see these little yellow cables. That's fiber optics. So you look at this and you see thousands and thousands of racks. 
And what these racks do is, is they take your internet data and they switch it to the website you want to go to to get you the information you need. And so how big are these places? Well, they're as big as power stations. And actually, that's literally true. See this photograph here? This is a Google data center that's taken over an old power station. Power station's not used anymore, but it's a big building. So they chose a big building, and inside it is a data center. And so you can see another photograph. These are Google data centers. Look at the size of these places. So this is Google's today, but they're not the only guys in town. They're just a big player. It's going to be ubiquitous tomorrow. Every major company that's dealing with data is going to have a data center like this. They're going to be all over. They're just beginning. And so this is a trend that's not going to wane. It is going to be the communications hub of the future. And so this is data center and cloud focused. So what's actually happening inside these things? Well, they carry lots of data. And in fact, they're carrying so much data, you can't even imagine how big it is. Well, let me try and give you an idea. Everybody in this room probably knows what kilo is. Everybody knows what 1,000 euros is or $1,000, right? That's, that's K, right? Everybody knows what a million is. So that's one with six zeros behind it, right? Million dollars, million euros. So what are these data centers actually putting through? Well, they're talking about exabytes. Because you see this graph in the vertical here shows this is 107 exabytes. And you're seeing a lot of this traffic is this blue color. And the blue color is video. Well, that's folks like my wife streaming TV shows, right? And it's like my kids sending photographs and videos, right? So what does that all really mean? Well, what's an exabyte? Well, let's go down this chart. Exabyte is one with 18 zeros after it. That's a huge number. It's actually very difficult to imagine. And while we're doing 100 plus exabytes a month in 2016, the internet traffic is now roughly about two zettabytes, or if I say in American, two zettabytes. Right? And that's one with 21 zeros behind it. And that's huge. That just gives you some idea. This, these, this is a, these are large numbers. And to switch and redirect internet traffic with large numbers means you're going to have to have big data centers. So this has all been driven by us, the consumer internet. And you can see other categories there are data, video communications, online gaming, file sharing. So you can see everything gets counted. So if you look at the data centers, what's their challenges? What are their pain points? Well, clearly their pain points is that these guys are, are really big now. And they're not just small buildings. They're actually huge buildings. And so we have to change the way you interconnect all those racks together. So we're using single mode fiber. That's that yellow cable I showed you in the photograph. Well, they're going faster. As you can see from the market graphs, everybody's talking about 100D today. If you go in and talk to the Facebooks and the Googles and the Microsofts and the Amazons, they're talking about they want to see these sort of loose solutions. They want to see 400 gigs. This is what they're demanding. Um, and they're demanding this in the next five years. So they're not demanding it today. They want to see it in five years. And they want to see denser. They want us to actually see more optoelectronics crushed into those servers. They really don't want to have bigger data centers. They want to actually start miniaturizing the technology so they don't have to keep expanding. So they want a smaller footprint. And of course, these things, I mean, looking at uh, different government documents, these data centers are 3 to 5% of the USA's electricity bill. So you think about all the power that's consumed, they're taking 3 to 5%. That's a huge number. So you talk to the data center companies, and they want a greener solution. They want, they want a technology that doesn't consume as much power as is what it does today. And so in, in terms of transceivers, they're trying to get the wattage down, just like in a light bulb, when you go from an incandescent to an LED to reduce power. Same thing with the data centers. So advanced technology will win the data center business. And we know the polymer photonics, our technology, can meet these specs. We can scale in the better performance, is what they're looking for. And we know we can scale in lower cost. And that gives us a unique position in the marketplace. So let's take a look. This is a, uh, a figure that comes from Facebook. Facebook is actually redesigning their data centers. They're actually looking at swapping out all their fiber to go single mode fiber. 
And if you look at just one of their servers from an architectural standpoint, I mean, this is pretty complex. But what does it really say? It's got lots and lots of fiber. There's hundreds of thousands of fiber optic links. These links are 500 meters each. Once they've designed the data center and they've got the fiber in to connect all these servers, they don't want to keep changing it. What they want to change is the modules at each end, and they want to upgrade the modules to higher performance and lower cost. And so what that does for us, see, reuse a fiber plant and upgrade the optical ports. That's what we're working on, the optical ports. So users are driving. These big data centers are huge volumes of optical interconnects. And this is what's given us the market opportunity. And you can see here there's uh, spine switches and spine planes. I mean, it's pretty complex. But it means there's a huge volume market. So what does it actually look like? So this is a photograph inside a data center. It's a different one, of course. And you can see all these cabinets. But this is what a server looks like. And what I want to focus on here is, is not what's behind it, but these are face plates. And these are face plates. This is where you connect all the fiber in the front. And one of the things you should think about here is, is here's a face plate. Here's just one of them. And it's got these big black sort of areas there. That is absolutely jam-packed with fibers and photonics. They can't get any more in, and it becomes a problem. So let's talk about that a second, because this is going to show you the reason where our technology is going to go. Lots and lots of servers with face plates for ports. So this is how they're all connected. It's sort of a simplistic diagram, but it, I've tried to make it easier to understand. So you've got one of these racks, and here's one we saw in the first photograph. You can see these yellow cables. These yellow cables I've drawn here to show very simplistically how we connect these together. Right, so on the left here, here's a server rack. The black ones are old copper cable. They only go very short distances now with the speeds we're looking at. The orange cable goes a little bit further in distance. That's what's old multimode cable, multimode fiber cable. But the technology that really is aligned from where we are and our products are going to go is the single mode fiber, which is the yellow one. These are the transceivers that you see from other companies at the top. And what I'm showing is, is this sort of area, this sort of opportunity here and on this, uh, this connect and this connect and this connect, it fits our technology perfectly. And so I'm showing that single mode optics where you have our little transceivers going with fiber that's 100 meters to about 2 kilometers, 2,000 meters here, that's perfect for us. So our polymer will impact the interconnects, links, and switches with that yellow cable, the single-mode cable. And this is how it connects these servers together. So this is where it goes into the data center. So um, why are we talking about these yellow cables and not the orange ones? Because the orange ones are fiber optic cables, too. Well, fiber optic cables, the orange ones, are known as multi-mode fiber. They really can only go about 100 meters. After about 100 meters, you can't get good signals through them. And the problem today is these data centers are so large, even though it's a solution that's been used for the last uh, 10 years, uh, you can't use these cables in connecting servers that go more than 100 meters apart. And it's not just 100 meters. It's sort of like you have to go up, you have to go into the roof of the data center, you have to come down again. So it's really only about 30 meters when you think about where the cable has to go. And so this is a big problem. So people are now focusing on redesigning data centers with single-mode fiber. That's ideal for our technology. Now, our, our technology is single-mode. So 100 gig, 400 gig becomes more ubiquitous using single-mode fiber. It's perfect for us. We know we can go 500 meters. We know we can go 2,000 meters. And we know we can go 10 kilometers. And so this is a, a way of looking. In the business, we call that an interconnect fabric. It's not actually a piece of material, but it's, the way people look at it is because we have all these fibers crisscrossing, we actually call it a fabric. And if you look at the vertical of this graph, which is speed, a really high speed, 50 gigabits per second here, and on the bottom, on the horizontal, you see distance. And so we're showing a sweet spot up for our polymer modulators in the 500 to 2,000 meter in the sort of a 10 gigabit up to 50 gigabit range. Now, you see on the left in the black is where the copper is. Copper doesn't go very far, and it's really limited. That's why it's not being used anymore. The multi-mode fiber can only go about 100 meters, so it's being phased out. And we're actually ideally positioned uh, to go into the single-mode fiber area. 
at these sort of speeds and um, reaching 2,000 kilometers single mode fiber and having parallel WDM solutions. So it just so happens in a data center business, we're perfectly positioned. So the sweet spot for polymer modulators is that yellow region. So let's have a look at this faceplate again. This faceplate, if you look at it closely, you see a lot of black holes. These black holes are these types of um, receptacles where the transceiver where our technology is going to go will fit in. They're sort of pluggable, so you can plug them in. Now, if you look at the front of that, that faceplate, in this particular case, there's 48 ports, or 48 of these guys in the front. There's no room for cooling, so we have to cool these things down, so it's really difficult to actually get cool air in. And the customers don't want 48. They'd really like 96. But how do you do it, right? So you can make these boxes smaller if you, if you can, or you can try and shoehorn more photonic technology in the boxes. That's a real difficult problem. Um, in fact, some of the new designs I saw from Microsoft and TE Connectivity recently showed that they've got fiber optics going through the side and actually connected right on the board because they sort of come up to a brick wall that they're trying to figure out how to work through it. But in the end, what's actually going to win how, if you can actually put more photonics functionality inside these boxes, then you actually solve that problem. The only way to do that is to miniaturize the photonics. It's the only way to do it. And so we've got a crammed faceplate, and this is what's going to happen. You're going to have to miniaturize it, and you're going to have to put more than one photonic device on a, on a chip. That's the only way to do it. So we're going to have to get more photonics functionality into these boxes. And the buzzword today for doing this is called PIC, a photonic integrated circuit. That enables higher traffic. And what it basically says is, is we're going to have, instead of one or two photonic devices, we're going to have 10. We're going to have 100 devices in these boxes. So we don't have to change the face plates. We just make them um, more functional by having more photonic devices. And this is where the industry is going. So we're solving the compactness problem through miniaturization. So let's think about that a second. If we went 50 years ago, if you think about what an IC, everybody knows the term IC, a silicon IC. It's an integrated circuit. But what actually is it? Well, 50 years ago, we reinvented a transistor at Bell Labs. Right? And about 48 years ago, Texas Instruments put two transistors together on a chip. So we had more than one tr transistor. So that's an integrated circuit. It's a circuit with more than one transistor. Well, today, you go to companies like Intel, you get 3 billion transistors on a chip using CMOS. Everybody's heard of CMOS, I think. So a microprocessor will, that you have in your laptop has 3 billion transistors. So that's really advanced. In the photonics world, um, a photonics integrated circuit is more than one photonic device, exactly the same definition. But in the photonics world today, the most advanced PICs only have about 100 photonic devices, in some cases 1,000. We're nowhere near where the silicon technology is. It's much more difficult to do in photonics. But now people are realizing the only way to solve these data center challenges is, is to actually do this. So that means, from our perspective, if we have two modulators, two polymer modulators on a chip, we now call it a PIC. If we have 10, it's still a PIC. And so we're now following that trend, just like ICs. So let's look at that. We have the slot modulator. The slot modulator we've, we've done, it's a polymer modulator on a silicon platform. And that is a perfect vehicle to solve some of the PIC problems. Data center designers want more. They want a path to really higher speeds. That's like 100 times increase over today. How do we actually do this? Well, we can have more than one device on a chip. That's how you do it. Polymer photonics. We're using the slot modulators with silicon passive photonic devices. It puts the slot modulator fits perfectly into the silicon platform. And this is just fantastic for our technology. So this is a, a slide that shows you some of the work we've done. This is slot, mod, slot waveguide modulators. These are actually slot waveguide modulators. There's the tip of a pen, I'm just showing you what the chip size is like, so they're pretty small. So these are silicon chips with uh, polymer slot modulators on board, some close-ups here. So we've, December, we've already demonstrated that on a silicon platform. So we're well down the path of understanding what it's going to take 
to be successful in this marketplace. So we're showing technical feasibility. We've used the organic polymers, and so things are looking good. So what does the customer want? I mean, okay, it's okay to produce a polymer modulator, put it on a piece of silicon, but how are we going to get the customer really excited? Well, let's think about what they want. Today, and there's, there's a little bit of math here, so I'll take you through slowly. Um, 2015, here's your fiber link, right? Let's call it 2,000 kilometers, single mode fiber link. It's running at about 100 gigabits per second, right? This is what they want today. At each end, they want a they want a port, a transceiver, but all they can find today is $1,000. So they go to a normal supplier today, they'll pay $1,000 for each end of that link. So one end, it's got a laser in it, sends light down, modulates the light, sends it down, receives it the other end. So if you think about that for a second, it's going to cost these guys $2,000 for that link. And for $2,000, it's going 100 gigs per second. Well, if you just work that out, that's about $20 per gigabit. So it's costing them $20 to send one gigabit of data down that link. They think it's too expensive. They really want to bring the price down. So they've issued a challenge to the whole industry. Guys, come up with something that gets us to a much lower metric. We want to only pay a dollar per gigabit. But nobody can do it. Nobody's even close to that. So if you look at the optical component companies out there today, I've certainly seen many of the companies when I was giving talks in Brussels and, and meeting various companies in the Bay Area. You need to be able to, first of all, they're saying, you know, 100 gigs, five years' time, it's got to be 400. It's going to be four times faster. So you've got to come up with a solution that's much faster. And we only want to pay about $200 each end. So if you add that together, that $400 or 400 gigabits per second, that's a dollar per gigabit. Now, so what they're actually saying is, is like, just give us any technology that, that can get to these metrics and show us that can scale to these metrics. And so when we sat down and done our homework, we realized polymer photonics, we can get to these metrics and we can still guarantee our profit margins because our technology can scale better than the other technologies. So now we're sitting here thinking, wow, we can actually do what these guys want and still make money. And that's, that's something I didn't realize a year ago. So over the last year when I've been here, it's like, this is a fantastic opportunity. So in five years' time, we get our technology up and running, we'll have some big customers. And so we did some uh, modeling in-house. In and you can see um, we can actually scale our technology to meet this target. And so we know we can scale it up in performance and down in cost. So this is really exciting. So we know it's a natural-based technology to achieve these specs. And when I gave this talk in March in Brussels, some of the feedback from the customer base was, wow, we weren't thinking about this technology. Now it's on the radar screen. They are thinking about it. So this is exciting. So here's a conceptual vehicle, if you like, of what it would look like. So where would our modulators go? They'll go here, four modulators. This is a piece of silicon, right? And this brown bit is, is a laser array. Now, we're not going to make lasers. We're going to buy lasers in from the laser suppliers. And we're going to uh, mount it onto the silicon chip. And we're going to have our polymer modulators. We're going to couple the light from the lasers through waveguides into the modulators. And it's going to work at 100G. We know a polymer photonics pick is exactly what the customers want. Do we have it today? No. Are we in a, the right strategic direction to get to this point? Yes. So yes, this is conceptual, but this is where we're going. And we now know the customers want this type of solution. We know what they want to pay for it, and we have a very good idea how we can scale our technology together. And so here's the end game, right? So here's that little chip again. So that chip actually fits into what, what we call in the industry an OSA, an optical subassembly. An optical subassembly is a part that goes into these boxes, these pluggable transceivers. So the bit that we're going to do in this company is the engine. Now, the easiest way to think about this is it's like an Intel inside. You know, when Intel came up with that thing where they had the microprocessor chip, and it's Intel inside in cheap computer, and we had stickers on all the computers. I can't use that, of course, because that's Intel's copyright. But, but this is our engine. We're going to have a polymer engine inside 
these transceiver modules. We don't need to get into this part of the business because there's 20 companies that can metal bend and make printed circuit boards. Our unique technology value to the customer is here. This is what they're going to pay for. This is what the valuation is all about. So this is the key. We put this into a little optical subassembly, and then we can partner with the company can, that can actually put it into the box, put the box into the data set. Um, so this is how it's all going to fit together. So LightWave can partner for these boxes. These are the names they use in the industry, CPF4, QSFP, micro QSFP, as the key technology is the polymer photonics engine. So treat our technology as the, the intel inside, quote unquote, for this type of technology. So we're, we're designing the engine for the next generation data centers. And look at the market. Our timing is perfect, right? Uh, market is poised to grow. We're seeing a 100 gig takeoff for 2020. So we're seeing a sharp rise in the 100 gig curve. The 400 gig hasn't taken off yet. That market's going to grow really quickly. And so the slot modulator from a polymer photonic standpoint can be the engine of revenue growth for us getting into this market. We're not too late. The timing is just right for us. I think at this point, oh, here's the last slide. This is how it fits with some of the other technologies today. So we're not the only technology in town. I've heard um, tonight and this morning, or last night and this morning, um, Indian phosphide. Well, Indian phosphide is an incumbent. It is used today. Right? And so there's Indian phosphide laser and Indian phosphide photonics. We all know Indian phosphide is the solution, but it's expensive. And it can't scale to where the customers really want it to go to. And then on the other hand, we've heard of silicon photonics. Silicon photonics is having difficulty scaling because it's still expensive. But what we know is, is if we can combine our technology with silicon photonics and even some of the Indian phosphide, as I showed with the laser, we can scale and get the performance. So we're sitting on a technology that bridges these two big areas, and we know we can be successful. So the takeaway is the polymer photonics is the right vehicle for the data centers, at which point I think I'm going to hand over to Tom. As you see, the, uh, the potential here is enormous. So what I'm going to do now is just close this thing out by going through uh, a few charts that are actually going to show you where we are now, and, and you've seen the PRs and all the other stuff we put out. So what does that all really mean, and how do we compare or match up against the, the market that uh, Michael just went through, okay? And, and why are we doing what we're doing? So let's just kind of backtrack a little bit on what are the, the material successes that we've had uh, over the past year. And we took our chromophores, our materials, and we computer modeled those. And what was really fun for me to see, and I know the board was excited about, is we took that model. We actually built or created those molecules, the, the dyes that are part of uh, our system that are very high temperature capable. Then we put them in solution, and you remember me talking about, you know, R33s and all this other business that nobody knows what it means, okay? Well, what it meant was when we put our chromophore into a solution and then put it on some test slides, we were able to cook that stuff, and Steve did it, all right, for over 2,000 hours at 110 degrees centigrade. Why do we care? We care because... A normal device, like Michael was talking to, operates roughly, even in cold storage, at about 85 degrees centigrade. And that's kind of the industry standard. We got excited about this because we weren't satisfied with meeting the industry standard. We wanted to see how well it would do. So we had Steve, we whipped them around and said, okay, just burn these things till they can't stand it anymore. And they stood it great. Okay, so we exceeded that by a lot for over 2,000 hours. So then what was the next thing? You gotta make sure, will the material break down? If it's sitting out on the table, if it, you know, do you need some kind of protection? If you expose it to oxygen, you expose it to nitrogen, what, what do you have to do? So what we did outside of a device, we took the same materials and then uh, the guys back in Delaware were exposing them to different environments. And in that one, in a nitrogen environment, 
we exceeded 4,000 hours with little to no degradation. So what does that really mean to you? We then have to take, and then we, because that was successful, we said that we have a really good material here. Then we need to go, let's put it into a device and see what happens. Can you just spread the material on there? Do you have to have a, a cladding or a coating on it to protect it? We, these, these were all things we had to find out. We, this is all new territory, right? But because of all these successes in the green on this chart, we then said, all right, we're ready to go to a device. This is a long process. Have we stopped with just because we have one material that's doing really well? No. Besides, our guys in Delaware love tinkering, right? They're just like any good you know, chemist. They are always looking for the next best engine. And 